In a world where nuclear war has begun, vampires fought back in super real 3D. Dual native ISO. It's great, right? Um, what One of the advantages to having dual native ISO that I just absolutely adore is not only that does it help you in low light situations because you're resetting your base ISO. Your base ISO is normally just one number, oftentimes in most of these digital cameras nowadays, it's around 800 ISO, and that's gonna be like the cleanest signal that you can get, the best color rendition, and the best dynamic range that the sensor will offer you. Having dual native ISO allows you to then have a second base ISO that's much higher. In this case, on the Canon R5C, it has a 3200 base ISO that you can then bump it up to. So that's called a dual native ISO. And when you go up to that, yes, it will help in low light. But the thing that's really an advantage to it, in addition to that, that I don't hear enough people talking about that I want you to think about, especially if you're just getting into shooting and you don't have many lights, which is a lot of people. A lot of people start out with just the cameras and then you, the next thing sound, right? And then you're gonna get better sound. And then lights are oftentimes, you know, last or you have very minimal lighting. And what Hollywood has is a lot of lights. Like when you look at these films, there's a ton of light going on in a lot of these scenes to make the scenes look the way that they do. And they're actually putting the aperture at a much higher number for a more full depth of field in many scenes. Now, I'm not saying shallow depth of field isn't a big thing used in cinema, but a lot of stuff is actually at a higher aperture, you know, like an F4 or an F5.6. It, it can, and it can go way higher than that. I'm just pointing out these are actually considered lower numbers of, uh, of aperture use in a lot of shots that you'd see in blockbuster films. And the only way that to achieve that is that if you test that out on your camera indoors, it's gonna be pretty dark. So having better low light performance is going to give you the ability to go to a higher aperture, and then you can have a more full depth of field and a full depth of field is where you're actually seeing more of the background. You know, that blur, that pop that happens when you're trying to get that singular object in focus and the rest behind you blur. Like right now, I've got a pretty good blur. I'm at a 2.8 aperture. This is, and I do do this. Please don't get me wrong. This is like, obviously I'm doing it right, right now. But there's a lot of times where you have an environment where you really want to take advantage of a full depth of field. And I'll tell you, for a music video or you're setting up a scene, for a product commercial or something like that, and it's actually got people in it, you got this whole you know thing set up, you got everybody in the right positions and stuff, you don't necessarily always want blur there. You kind of want to showcase the thing that you have created, like the scheme that you've created, so full depth of field matters there. If you don't have enough lighting to put your aperture up higher, around four, five, six, and onward, eight, maybe an F8, to get that full depth of field, well, this is where having low light ability really helps. Now, I won't lie, Sony is, like the king of low light, but there is an interesting test out there. I don't know if I'll have time to find it again, but I'm telling you, I watched it playing today, and if you look on YouTube, you can find it, where it's comparing the Canon R5C going through low light, uh, basically a base, its ISO range all the way up to 12,000. And it's being compared to the Sony, either the FX3 or the AS3, and which is really the same sensor anyway. And it actually looked cleaner up to 12,000. I know that sounds crazy, but when it reset back at the base ISO of its dual native base ISO of 3200 as it went up, I want to say it was still cleaner than the Sony up to about 10,000, possibly even 12,000. This is a video I watched about a year ago because I've had the Canon R5C4 a year and it was like before I got it and I was like, man, that's fantastic because I'm so invested with Canon at this point, it'd be hard to change back to Sony because I originally was on Sony, then I went to Canon and I've also got red. But anyway, long story short, full depth of field is something that you can take advantage of even with minimal lighting if you have better low light sensitivity and having a dual native base ISO that can go up allows for that signal to be so clean. And this is where I'm saying that somehow the, the can I'm sorry, the Sony a7S III and the FX3, they don't reset. It's not a dual native ISO. It's just a really great low light sensitive camera. So there's actually a different noise pattern in it than what happens when you get to 3200 on the Canon R5C, for instance, where it truly resets and it's a clean image just as if you were filming at 800 ISO. And I think, and because of that, apparently, I mean, I've watched it with my own eyes. The It looked better in low light all the way up to around 10, 12,000. Now, I rarely need to go past that. I don't even ever go to 10,000. I mean, I, I'm 
at five and six thousand is usually the highest that I go. So if I've got a cleaner signal all the way up through there, then this is the camera for me. So definitely take advantage if you have a good low light camera or you have dual native ISO in your camera and don't just go to that in a low light setting. Think about how you can use that to your advantage to have a full depth of field. And if you're a seasoned shooter, you've already thought about doing this, but trust me, I have talked to a lot of people that don't even think about using it that way that are just getting started. And so I'm trying to let you know if you're just getting into this and you've got this powerhouse camera, because it's crazy how powerful our cameras are nowadays for the money that we pay for them. Take advantage of it in this direction. Don't always go for shallow depth of field. Try out your full depth of field. Really test yourself. Think about everything that's in your shot and how you're gonna try and make that entire environment, everything that's in the frame of your footage, be there kind of for a reason or where you position the camera that there's actually some kind of motion to it, like a, a way that leads the eye in an interesting way. And it, by putting it in a full depth of field, you can achieve that by taking advantage of the background keeping it in that shallow depth of field range. It's, it, it's different, it's just very different. The eye's already on the subject that you have in focus. It doesn't have nearly as much opportunity to constantly create like some kind of zigzag or flow that's guiding the eye to something. Um, it's an easier way to get away with hiding a cheap room, uh, you know, a room that doesn't have much to show or cheat that it's actually a really small room and you're making it, trying to make it feel bigger. Shallow depth of field allows you to cheat a lot of stuff too. But full depth of field, it's like, wow, the production value is there all the way if you can make a shot saying that is that full depth of field. So there you go. Take advantage of that low light or dual native base ISO and best of luck to you guys. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Movie Voice.